Welcome to the Project Zion podcast. This podcast explores the unique spiritual and theological gifts Community of Christ offers for today's world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Project Zion podcast. I'm your host, Carla Long, and you are listening to the What's Brewing series. It's a series that talks about all the good mission stuff that's happening all over the church, and I am really excited to be with a panel of people today from the Headwaters Mission Center. They're a volunteer group of people who, I'm not even kidding, folks, make it happen, and they're going to tell us how they do that, and I'm really excited to hear. So we have five people on the podcast today. We have Matt and Chris and Serena and Colleen and Karen, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you, and I'm going to say, I'm just going to go with Colleen, you're first. So Colleen, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name's Colleen Hancock. I live in Rochester, Minnesota, and I am the pastor here, and um, that's all right. I know, uh, Colleen, I know what being a pastor is like. It is tough work and it's not just this. It is a lot of work. I get it. Thank you. It's good to have you here. Karen, what about you? I'm Karen Hill. I'm part of the Mission Center presidency team. I live in a suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota. So I'm kind of on the Western part of the Mission Center and I am the like I said, co-presidency team with Chris. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you here, Karen. What about you, Serena? My name is Serena Sato, and I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, and I am the Gathering Ministries team coordinator. We'll talk more about what that means later. Yes, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. And next we have Chris. I'm Chris Daviston. I live in Dubuque, Iowa, and attend church in Lancaster, Wisconsin, so way down on the southern part of our mission center. And I serve on the mission center presidency team with Karen. Good deal. And last but not least, Matt. My name is Matt Daviston. I live with Chris down in Dubuque, go to um, (laughs) church in Lancaster. My role uh, for the Mission Center is a little bit. I am the Mission Center Council Secretary, so I take information in meetings. I'm also the Mission Center Center Tech Dude, so my job is to make sure that all the technical things are moving on. And uh, I also serve as the uh, pastor of the Lancaster congregation, so I've got a, a few different hats to wear. Uh, you have a ton of hats to wear. My goodness. Speak, yeah. Tech dudes are like the most important dudes right now in this pandemic. So thank goodness for tech dudes. Thank you, Matt. So um, everyone, I'm really curious um, how it's been working in the Headwaters Mission Center because you're an all volunteer team. And so I want to hear what that looks like. Some people think that you have to have paid ministry in Mission Center a leadership, but you're telling me that's not true. So tell me a little bit more about how that works. Well, um, we have a, a presidency team, as you heard with our introductions. So Karen and I work together. We talk through things and we, um, we communication has been really key in, in how we interact with each other and, and, and what we do. But we have a lot of help too, and a lot of support. And we have our financial team is also mostly all mostly volunteer um there is one caveat in there so we have two people on the financial team um but one of those people she's been our she does our bookkeeping and things as well so she is part-time paid in that role but but they're a team and then we also work closely with our mission center council which includes our mission center invitation and support minister Uh, We have a newly added youth ministry team, and we have our gathering ministries coordinator, uh, which is Serena, and she'll share a little bit more in a minute about what that is. We have a spiritual team as well, and we have, of course, our financial team. We have our tech dude, and uh, we have our cluster ministers. And so we have four cluster ministers. Uh, Our mission center is divided up into four different clusters of congregations mostly geographically oriented. And um, so Colleen is, represents one of those. And I can uh, have her share a little bit more about what that looks like and in her ministry. Yeah, I'd love to hear about what that looks oh, like. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. Karen wants to talk. 
I just want to say something. Um, Chris and I do a lot of communicating back and forth with you with each other, sometimes starting to text as early as, well, it used to be 6.30 in the morning. We delayed it now until almost eight, but <laughs> we do text a lot during the day. We email, we have phone conversations, and it's just to make it work, you have to communicate. I'm so glad you said that, Karen, I <laughs> because you're absolutely right. And um, I really appreciate knowing that there's a, a really tight connection there. I knew there had to have been, but I'm really glad to know that. Thank you so much. Colleen, did you want to talk about the cluster ministry? Is that right? Sure, sure. Um, we have five congregations in the cluster, the central cluster that I'm kind of leading. Three of those are in Wisconsin and two are in Minnesota. I would have to say I would just double back on what Karen and Chris both have said about the communication because we have the communication from their leadership we have meetings monthly, and I call, text, email, visit. We have even met halfway in the pandemic with masks on to talk across a parking lot with one of the congregations. And I keep, when I know what's going on with them, I make sure that I take notes. Sometimes call them back next week. They're scheduled for a pre-op appointment. And I call and find out who they have on their prayer list within their congregations. And we actually, the Zoom meetings that we've had since the pandemic has strengthened that. We have so many people with so many talents and so many gifts who are willing to step up. So many people that weren't able to gather physically before that are willing on Zoom. We, we have probably a tighter connection within that cluster and some additional congregations that have joined in with us for worship twice a week. Like back in the old days, we used to have prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. We have that again. And we have Sunday morning worship. We have people stepping up to preach and sing songs on recorded, record themselves or send a video and just experiment with new ways to do that. And under normal circumstances, part of the traveling ministry that we do here and my husband and I and a couple other people in the mission center have, um, I would say that after we started doing it, the mission center recognized that as an important thing to do. So they have supported paying for gas or mileage, or if we have to stay in a hotel, that type of thing, the mission center does pay for that. Honestly, we were doing it before because we wanted to. And our, our congregation here in Rochester is so focus solely on hospital ministry at Mayo. So we are in a unique position where we don't have a building here where we can travel throughout the mission center. And that has been such a blessing, such a blessing to, to meet new people and get to know them. And it's, it's become more like a family and the volunteer part of it. So, so many people are so willing to step up and do those kinds of things and, and just, get some different perspective and somebody new in to say something and, or sing a song for them during their service or whatever they want us to do. That's, that's what we do. And that really has also strengthened our cluster too. I would add that between the pastor support meetings, the, the educational things that, that Chris and Karen put in front of us, we have so many choices and so many people have stepped up to do things within that um, realm of, I want to learn about this, or I want to learn about that. And I've texted Karen even late at night. And I haven't done that with Chris so much because she's got kids at home. But but with Karen, I even will text her late at night and say, what do you think about this? Or, or, or she'll text me as they're driving through and say, what's the roads like in Rochester? And there, there really is a tight communication and within the groups. That sounds like that might be so far the key to why this is working out so well, which is really cool. And uh, I agree with you. I think that this pandemic has been really, really hard in so many ways, but you get to see so many different people. And in, I know in Salt Lake City, at least, we always have visitors stopping into our church and stuff. And now they can stop in and it's not so scary. They can just like have their little name on the screen. They, we don't even have to see their face. And so like, there's so many different ways that they can explore um, what it means to be in community of Christ right now. So I, I think this right. pandemic has been helpful, I guess is the word I'd use in a lot of ways, but also still so hard, still so hard. That was a wonderful explanation of cluster. Okay, go ahead. 
I, I would just add one thing or a couple things. Even with the Zoom, we have discovered not only can we do virtual reunions, but we've had Halloween costume parties. We had a virtual online potluck and a contest of hot dish versus casserole. We have had a, an, a virtual Christmas pageant where we mailed costumes to people and they dressed up and took pictures of themselves. And then we merged them into a pageant format. And it, a lot of people wouldn't do that under normal circumstances, but we sure had a lot of volunteers this time. How wonderful. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think potlucks are the reason I became a minister. I love them so much. <laughs> They're some of my favorite things. Well, I've I've actually never been part of a cluster congregational group. So, but now I kind of want to. It sounds really fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Thank you. It so is. Much. Um, so what else is going on in your, I, Chris, oh. you mentioned a whole bunch of stuff at the very I beginning. I did. I did. Um, so, uh, we'll ask Serena to share a little bit about what Gathering Ministries is. Sure. I can jump on that. Um, Gathering Ministries is basically what we call our camping and retreat program. So several years ago, as we were going through some changes in our mission center, a group of people got together to really think about, like, what does this mean and what do we want it to mean and what would be most meaningful um, and really put in a lot of great groundwork to think about um, just the purpose and the the direction that they wanted it to go. And this focused heavily on youth and what we wanted to provide for our youth, but it is not only youth. So Gathering Ministries team kind of thinks high level, you know, but then also gets really down into the details because we're helping to facilitate all of the youth camps as well as retreats. Um, we'll help maybe add on some activities in addition to the mission center conferences and things like that. So we, we make sure we find directors, help the directors find staff, make sure they have the tools and resources that they need. We have a, a whole binder of information for them that we keep updated every year and just work really closely with them. So we'll have, we'll organize a director's retreat for training once a year to make sure that everybody has the most up-to-date information. And then just, again, just support them in their efforts to provide ministry through our camping program in particular. As well as the communication, what I feel like I keep hearing is a lot of trust in people. You know, uh, you have to a trust a lot of people if you're going to be a volunteer because you have your whole lives, your work lives, your family lives, and your church life. And so I love the idea of a director's retreat. We did that when I lived back in California. And I think that is so important. You know, you say, this is the information directors that you need to have now. Go be creative. Go make it the best camping experience that people have ever, ever had and go for it. So I think that is a really wonderful way to do it. Um, what did your camping program look like last year during COVID? Sadly, we weren't able to do any of the events in person. We had so many planned. We had, of course, junior camp, junior high camp, senior high. Uh, we had a senior high trip planned and then a men's retreat, a women's retreat, a young adult camping retreat, a ski retreat. So that's our typical kind of grouping of what we offer within a year. Uh, we're hopeful that this year we'll be able to offer some of those in-person events later in the year. And uh, for now, we're planning accordingly. Chris, did you want to say something? Yes. So while we weren't able to offer senior high camp or junior high camp, the junior highs, um, our camp directors, which is Serena and um, her staff, actually met with our junior high kids throughout the summer. So like they would just do virtual Zoom meetings twice a month, I think. Is that it? Yeah. And senior high also had a few meetings in the summer as well, virtually. But then for reunion, we, as Colleen had alluded to earlier, we, our reunion director was willing to to step up and offer a virtual reunion experience. Um, we had uh, Stacy Cram was our slate as our guest minister for the week. So uh, we didn't wanna <laughs> lose out and miss out on her ministry. So we uh, had a fantastic uh, virtual reunion. Our director mailed each registered participant a box of goodies. So they got a box of goodies in the mail uh, related to things that we were doing during the week and children's activities and crafts and things. And it was it was a it was a really fun experience. And we realized that we and we had people tuning in that had never been to an in-person reunion with us and realized 
realized that we do need to continue to offer some kind of virtual component to our reunion experiences. So that is a further challenge that we are going to do this year, but I am anticipating this being a continued experience, at least to offer some type of uh, virtual components that people can log into if they're not able to attend reunion in person. I think that's super important. And I think that's another thing that this pandemic has taught us that um, there's so many people out there who may not be able to leave their house for whatever reason. And we really need to do our best to minister to all persons and not just the ones who are mobile and can get out and do the things that we all love to do. So I think that's a really important lesson for all of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, it sounds like you have a really healthy camping program and nothing brings more joy to my heart than hearing a healthy camping program. Uh, camps are like the, my best memories as a kid. And I know it's true for so many people. Um, okay. So, wow. So we've heard about cluster groups, which is super important. And I already want to be part of a cluster. We've heard about camping programs and I really want to go to camp now. What else are you going to make me want to do? Um, log into Zoom. I don't know. I was going to have Matt share about his tech stuff. So... <laughs> One of the things that we found out uh, during the beginning of the pandemic was, okay, we need to pivot pretty quickly from in-person to Zoom. So uh, one of the things that, interestingly enough, our mission center, we are a geographically large mission center. So it's Minnesota and Wisconsin, parts of Northern Illinois, and because Chris and I live in, in Iowa, technically parts of Iowa as well, and North Dakota. We found that uh, even before the pandemic, we needed to figure out a way so that people didn't have to drive for four or five hours in order to see each other, in order to come together. So we were planning on creating what at the time were called tech centers, which was centralized locations within um, closer proximity so that people can go and, and be there and then utilize Zoom or its equivalent to video conference in to other, other places. That mindset was in process before the pandemic started. So when the pandemic started, everybody's like, well, we just need to do that for everybody. And so our mission center switching from in-person to Zoom was pretty fluid actually. And we actually set up, so we have a once a month mission center worship service. I get to be the host of that and people call in from all over in including outside of our mission center. And then the other thing that the technology has allowed us to do is really connect up. So one of the things that we realized is because we're now so geographically diverse, the distance between us in Zoom is a lot narrower. And one of the strange side effects of the pandemic is whereas before, and I can speak to this now, uh, this is we're recording this now in February. It's been really cold. We live in the north and weather is a thing. Like it's an actual thing. So in previous years, that was always a challenge to have uh, any kind of get together or gathering in the January, February timeframe because you might have to cancel because the roads are impassable. Well, we've never had to cancel anything on Zoom because of roads and uh, uh, the Lancaster congregation I can speak to, we have had to cancel um, church previously because the roads are terrible. And this year in the rare instance, we've never had to cancel Lancaster church, which is like kind of a thing. We haven't had to do that um, this year at all. So technologically speaking, it is a bit of a challenge. So uh, you, you need a tech person to be able to, to manage all of these things or someone at least comfortable with handling tech. Um, ideally, that that person has a decent internet connection. And we found that with our mission center, it, it works pretty well. The mission center worships have a pretty good attendance. Everybody really appreciates it. We, we see a lot of folks that can't come to church on a normal basis. We, we see a lot of folks that aren't necessarily within our mission center. So one of the strange developments out of the pandemic is we've come a lot closer as a mission center than we have previously. And I want to add some things that all of these fine folks previously have forgotten as far as gathering ministries. We also have a fair number of retreats, leadership style retreats, training retreats, and those things. And those were always kind of a challenge before to try to find a venue and to do all these things. And we'll we'll explain why they've a, they're a challenge for us to find a venue in, in a little bit. But with the, the Zoom, 
Um, our mission center has been involved with uh, the term uh, discover and live. So it's a new process to try to understand where God is calling us as a, mis as a mission center and as leaders. And we have transitioned those to being online. And because of that, we've gotten some really good ministry from people that we don't normally get to see. And those um, events were often some of the most difficult because they're a smaller set of folks and the weather kind of is a struggle. So we've been able to do all of those things in addition to what we normally do. And I think with the pandemic, we've actually done more in the virtual realm than we would have otherwise done. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the where we're at technologically is we, we get together. So we do a lot of that get together stuff. And I'd ask either, uh, Karen, tell us what else you do on a regular basis to communicate. I'm taking your job, Carla, to do what, what you do on a regular basis to communicate with the pastors that we haven't done prior to pandemic. We started doing a monthly Zoom meeting with them so that we could update them on <laughs> COVID graphs. And um, my husband actually, he's helps Matt with tech stuff and it helps that Chris and I each have our own tech person also. Um, <clears throat> he developed a spreadsheet that um, every day I go to the COVID sites and I track where the building is located, what the county cases are, and then there's this trend line graph. And every month we send it to the pastures so that they have a clue as to where they are. Um, but we also get to update them just if they have questions, we also, um, when they get to the spot where they want to do a reopening plan, we are willing to help them with that and um, keep them up to date on those aspects of it. But it's also just nice to be able to see what all the congregations are doing on a monthly basis, because some have really stepped up and are going above and beyond. And it's nice to be able to hear them kind of brag about themselves a little bit too but it's also nice to be able to support them in whatever way they need I would add to that Karen that that by having those monthly meetings it's not just an informative connection for all of us but it it's also can be personal what do you have going on in your life how can we support you we know you're going the extra mile with job family and church stuff so I think that's that's been an important connection too. And I think it goes back to what um, we were talking about before is that, you know, in order to, for this, all of this to work and, and really truly over all over community of Christ in order for this to work, since we have 90% lay ministry anyway, we, we have to have that connection and we have to have that support. So I'm really happy to hear about the, the monthly pastor calls. I think those are super important. I do want to go back to something that Matt said, um, you know, what you're talking about, how you haven't missed a Sunday yet because of bad weather. I think that kids everywhere are mourning that because they'll never have another snow day ever, <laughs> ever again, because everyone's so good at Zoom now. They don't have to worry about snow days anymore. And that is really sad for me too. Snow days were the best. So anyway, it's a good thing, Matt, and a not so good thing all at the same time. Um, and it's cool that you're having leadership retreats. You're still having leadership retreats. I, I think that's pretty wonderful. Also, I, I, any way that we can support our leaders and let them know that what they do is super important and that we desperately need them, I think is a good thing. Um, well, this is sounding really good so far. I, uh, what, what else am I missing? Um, I, let me, I, I will speak to, um, our spiritual team because we, um, they're not represented here in this panel, but uh, they are important to us in the ministry that, that we're able to offer. Um, it's currently, it's a team of three, yeah, I'm thinking four, yeah, four people. Um, we have evangelists primarily, one is an ordinand in, on that team, and uh, they also provide the spiritual support. So they're, they're praying, right, for and praying for the needs expressed in the mission center. They're connecting and making connections with, with people as needed and provide a very important presence with us on our council. And uh, with the kind of being able to support and hear some of the needs that are going on in the different clusters and being able to reach out and 
in non-pandemic times, they would travel um, and provide ministry that way, but doing phone calling and writing letters and, um, and emails and support of folks has been, has been an important part of our ministry, right? It's not just administrative, it's not just planning and leading things, but it's that spiritual component as well. Oh, thanks for saying that. I appreciate knowing that as well. I mean, it's all the doing stuff is super important, but the being stuff is really, really important too. So you've talked about how big your mission center is and it encompasses what, like six states or something like that. That's, that's a nice four. Big mission center. How many? Four. Oh, just four. Oh, yeah. well, I tried to make it sound much bigger. Darn it. Well, <laughs> It's well, 16 if you count Iowa. <laughs> yeah, if you count Iowa, it is five. But, right. and, and very big. They're very big states. Very big states. We're not talking like, no offense to Rhode Island, but we're not talking about Rhode Island here. We're talking about big places. <laughs> um, so it's a huge mission center, really, really big. So how do you address building those relationships across the mission center? I know you've already kind of talked about that, but I, if you can, I want to hear a little bit more about that. And, you know, talk to me a little bit more about those education moments that you have for pastors and priesthood and how do you communicate all that stuff? I know it's a big question. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I think I'll speak to a little bit more about the discover and live your future um, because that has been, we've been on that journey for a year and a half. Uh, Originally, we were going to have two retreats a year. We've had one in person. (laughs) because of when it started. And so uh, we've been working with uh, President of 70, Larry McGuire, on that. And Richard Betts has also been um, working with us on that. And so uh, last year, our second retreat was right on the cusp of it was supposed to happen and didn't like it was like a February, March thing that we were supposed to have. And so uh, we ended up having just like a, a short opportunity, like a couple hour I think experience uh, in April of last year, but then we had another full retreat in September, like a day long. And then we just had another one uh, back in January, right? The end of January. and No, beginning of February. And uh, so it is, um, it's not open. It's open to people beyond just our pastors. So it's anybody that was interested in being um, a part of the journey. And we've got about 40 people that, um, have attended retreats with us on that, and we're, we're using the mission prayer and uh, and focusing on the themes of awaken, risk, and bless. And I know that I think there's been some Project Zion podcasts on this as well, so uh, we can probably delve a little bit deeper with, with some other folks on that. But we are in the middle of our risk uh, the risk area right now and learning more about what that means for us and focusing on uh, what it means to build authentic relationships and what does it mean to take risks in our discipleship and probably one of the more practical things that we have uh, implemented across the mission center is just a lot more spiritual uh, practice and missional practices as and every time we gather we are uh, doing those and focusing on that and then so so it's a kind of we've got the corporate level of that and then the individual journey as well and um, what does it mean to take to risk something new in our ministry and our relationships um, as moving forward and so it's been a really uh, important part of our discipleship as a mission center and being able to come together and focus on those. I don't know if anybody wants to share more about it. I would just add one thing, Chris. Um, We have just, after a year into it, we have also, and I think this was the plan all along, broken down within the cluster groups in the mission center, the people that have been a part of the Discover and Live Your Future program are meeting in smaller groups now to take what we learn in those retreat times and how do we apply what we've learned to not just our personal lives, but within our congregations and brainstorm ideas on how can we make this actually work. So that's, that's been interesting. We've had two meetings within the small clusters after the retreat and, and it's, they're really kind of more getting into the meat of what it means on a day-to-day basis. 
Oh, that sounds wonderful. That's wonderful. Awaken, risk, and bless. That's what, that's the three, right? It sounds mm-hmm. really good. So uh, I, I want to speak a little bit more about the geography of our mission center, because the you ask an interesting question, Carla, and the reason why it's an interesting question is because there was a time pre-pandemic where our answer would have been very, very different. And I want to speak a little bit about that time, because having Minnesota, having Wisconsin, northern Illinois, eastern North Dakota, and a smidgen of Iowa, what we found, we had to come together. And the question of building relationships across the mission center, it really came down to creating opportunities. And that's where our gathering ministries team was so important and vital is create opportunities for people to come together across the mission center and gather in one space gather in one space, see each other face to face, eat with one another, break bread together and share. And um, what we have found is the more often that we did that, the better the relationship building became and the more opportunities that we created to do that. And that was why that uh, team is so important is to create those opportunities. That's where getting together, that's how we supported each other. We've had a, a lot of good success creating educational opportunities for the whole mission center to come together, um, development of pastors and all of those things where we have Discover and Live is a great example of getting people in one space together. And it was intentional. I can tell you that pre-pandemic, it was pretty difficult to get everyone together. It's uh, for my family, it's a six and a half hour drive to Duluth, Minnesota. For folks in Rockford, Illinois, it's a six, six ish hour drive to get up to the Twin Cities. It's just difficult, but we made it a point in our mission center to say, no, we're going to do these things, which kind of meant we needed to find locations in the geographic center. One of the nice little points is if you look at our geographic center of our mission center, it's actually close to the Wisconsin Dells. So if you have heard of the Wisconsin Dells, they're a huge water park area. So we've found and have partnered with a a campground actually right in the Dells as one of the places that we use to get together and visit, not a community of Christ campground, but that, that has helped facilitate us. And I, and I want to kind of put a seed of, there has been some difficult decisions that we've made as a mission center that have allowed us the flexibility to be able to go outside of our community of Christ environment to, to meet together. But what has been important for our mission center is that we do come together as a full mission center and, and visit with one another and creating those intentional opportunities to do that. I appreciate you saying that a lot because there are times when we just hear about the good and easy and wonderful parts of uh, what it means to be a church. And I am a little bit glad to know that there are some hard decisions to be made because it's not all good and easy all the time. And some people listening to this might be thinking, well, what am I doing wrong? (laughs) You know, but no, it's not that the headwaters hasn't been through rough times and I, and you have to, and you have to continue to work your way through it as well. So gentle and wonderful listeners, it's not always easy. (laughs) There's work to be done. And um, I guarantee that we've all done it. And this, this, this mission center has definitely done it together. Also Wisconsin Dells, water parks and cheese. Like, is there anything better than water parks and cheese? I, I want to go for sure. Thank you, Matt, for explaining that a little bit better. Um, it's, that's a really big commitment to drive six and a half hours to one way to get somewhere. Yes. Colleen. Um, I was just going to add on to what you were saying, Matt. One of the things that I've appreciated is the compromise within our mission center too. Like for mission center conference, we would do one year in Apple Valley, which was closer to the western side, and the next year we hold it in Madison, which is closer to the eastern side. So people don't have to drive, one group of people don't have to drive eight hours to get somewhere each year. It, it's kind of a back and forth, so we trade off the, the long drive times. <laughs> That's smart and very kind, very kind, my goodness. Um, okay, so what else? What about else about these education opportunities and, the, and this communication and growing and building together? What am I missing? 
Well, I, I do want to have one more, sing one more comment about uh, with COVID, right? Because it has really caused us to be able to think about our educational opportunities differently. So that even when we are able to meet back in person again um, and have those gathering ministries opportunities, right? And discover and live and those things that we want to meet in person for, and those are important to us, but yet we can still throw in additional uh, educational opportunities on a weekend and do that by Zoom and, you know, some other things by Zoom and, and, um, and be able to provide additional opportunities. Like we were, we kind of added sort of a, a, at a last minute, we added a financial workshop coming up in March uh, for estate, estate charitable giving planning. And we would have never even thought to add something like that in the past, but this is like, well, let's just throw that in if people are interested and they can come and, and join and, and have that opportunity. And and so I think I anticipate those kinds of things continuing to happen down the road and so that we can continue to offer the educational opportunities. Um, we have done in the past as well, uh, like temple school classes uh, for the mission center, if we've got a number of folks that need to be ordained, um, we've done preaching workshops and just a variety of different things. Karen, did you have something? In November, I think it was, we did the unconscious bias workshop and our mission center was kind of the hot spot of the racial justice issue last year. I mean, there was a lot of hot spots across the U.S. I don't want to discredit that, but we had the Joy George Floyd incident here in Minneapolis and then we had the Kenosha event and it was just a good time to um, connect with Kathy Kaklarizzi and her team and so we had our own Saturday I believe it was workshop with them last fall and some of the congregations are going to follow up with that and do some stuff on their own as a result of that. So many opportunities that might not have been possible before for a lot of different people. Um, so I, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for sharing that. So one of the things I, I also wanted to bring up because we live in such a geographically diverse mission center, we have a lot of folk that are not near a congregation. So we have a lot of smaller-ish congregations, but even with that, we have a lot of people that are completely isolated from a community of Christ congregation. And, and a strange side effect of that is they have found a home with uh, Red Wing. Red Wing has managed the shift to online very, very well. And they have been the landing place for a lot of our displaced and distant folks so that now we have a congregation that is virtual, but with that virtual congregation, all of those folks that have been disconnected and um, not able to go to a close congregation now can go to Red Wing. And they've really built a really good, healthy, vibrant online congregation with people that have been yearning to connect for a very, very long time, and now they have a place. And it's only because we have found this new environment that has allowed us to do that. That I will just say the Red Wing congregation would be lucky to get six people on a Sunday morning in person. We now have 30 to 40 people every time we gather and everyone is engaged. Everybody wants to be there. It's amazing. That's incredible. It, it wasn't each one reach one. It was each one reach five. That's awesome. Well done. Very and cool. Sometimes they have their adult children that live in another country like yes. Italy and Bolivia. Bolivia. They join in. Yep. We have our Canadian friends in Thunder Bay and his son in Kitchener, Canada. They join in. Yep. The world suddenly got very small, didn't it? That's yes. very cool. Very cool. So what about like communication strategies? I, I, I keep hearing about amazing communication in, between all of you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, um, fairly early on, we realized, well, we've got all these virtual things going on. We need to communicate them somehow. And uh, not everybody's on Facebook because we do have a Facebook page. And uh, we were kind of using that uh, and occasional emails that we would send out and realized that we needed to start something a little bit more regular. And so we, I, I started sending out a weekly uh, newsletter 
email that just would list the things going on. Like, for example, letting people know where they can tune in online, right? I originally trying to get those resources out there and uh, communicating things that were going on in the mission center. And so that has morphed into an every week thing that I have continued on. And so we, we do send those things out and it has been nice to kind of have one clearing house to be able to get that information out to our members on that list. And then it also gets sent out to our congregational leaders who also then forward it on to their congregational membership. So um, we are hopefully getting the word out as best as we can. We do also have church updates that we use to try to share prayer requests and other things that is another option and another avenue for us to communicate what's going on in the mission center. Yeah, having that one thing that goes out to everyone and you know people at least have the information is such a relief to me (laughs) because sometimes I just put things out there on Facebook on our page or on our group and I'm like, well, I don't have any control over it anymore. I hope that they see it. It's it, it's a little bit stressful. I totally understand that. So a little while ago, Matt alluded to some, sometimes there's been some tough times. And I wonder if it has something to do with your campgrounds. Am I right or am I wrong? Am I right? So your mission center does, does not have any campgrounds that they own, right? No campgrounds, which blows my mind. So can you talk a little bit more about what it's like to have a camping program with no campgrounds and, you know, just kind of fill me in on what you do. I know I've already heard a little bit about Wisconsin Dells, but I'm sure there's more to it than that. So Carla, I'm going to kind of walk you through how we got from where we were to where we are, because I think the journey is at an important story to share because when we, prior to being mission centers, there were two districts. There was the Minnesota North Star District, and then there was the Wisconsin District. Each district had their own campground. Each district cared deeply about their own campground. As many districts around our uh, church had, or stakes around our church had it before we went into mission centers, every one of them had their own campground. When we were joined together as a mission center, now the mission center had two campgrounds and one was on one side of the mission center and the other was on the other side of the mission center, both pretty distant, give or take, from the center, the geographic center of the mission center, which made it very difficult for for some of us living on the periphery to be able to travel to. I mentioned it was a six and a half hour drive to Duluth. It's It was a eight hour drive to one of our mission center campgrounds. Whereas my wife and I live in Dubuque, Iowa, uh, Guthrie Grove, not Guthrie Grove, uh, Cedar Valley Grove is like 45 minutes from our house. So it's go to our mission center eight hours away or 45 minutes to a different mission center. But, um, there was a group that got together to discuss the issue. And that group consisted of five people that were for keeping our campgrounds, five people that were against keeping our campgrounds, and then five people that did not have an opinion about keeping our campgrounds. And we shared with one another the value of the campgrounds that we have, the value of campgrounds in general, and what that means to each of us and what it means to have sacred space and what it means to share that sacred space with people. And I was on that team. And one of the things that we found out from that team is sacred space can be found anywhere there are people. Any any place that you get together, you can have that sacred space. But we were struggling with is the only understanding of sacred space was our experience with our campground in Minnesota or our campground in Wisconsin. And that was our understanding of sacred space. As a group, we decided, and this is going to sound crazy, but we decided to not use our campgrounds, not sell them, keep them, but not use them. So for a couple of years, we had campgrounds and we did not use them. And instead, we decided as a mission center, we were going to have one reunion not two reunions with that alternated sides of the mission center, but one reunion where everyone could come together and share with one another. And we were going to do this not once, but twice to see what it, what an experience together was like. 
as we went through that journey, we realized that we really do like being together and that sacred space can be found wherever we are. Uh, interestingly enough, the reunion grounds, we rented reunion grounds from an outside group. The folks at the Association Retreat Center, it was in uh, Osceola, Wisconsin, which is a little bit outside of the Twin Cities on the Wisconsin side. And we found that while meeting there, it we we felt the connection. We felt the connection of our mission center. And because we have experienced it in that way, that is what helped everyone understand. And we did a kind of a, a journey together. We decided to sell both campgrounds. And so as an experience out of that, we, we sold both the Eagle Lake and our Oak Hills campgrounds. Now, I, I want to also point out there was a grieving experience out, out, out that came out of that because it is not easy letting go of something that there's so much energy and effort that goes into that. And I want to say to you, you listeners out there, it was not an easy thing for the Headwaters Mission Center to do. And there is still grieving that occurs when we remember these campgrounds. But we, we moved together out of that and what we said is, we said, if we're going to sell our campgrounds, we want to make it easier for people to get together. And this is probably the the interesting side effect that has happened. Well, we sold our campgrounds, which kind of gave us an endowment. It gave us a camping endowment. And we used that camping endowment to help offset the costs of camping outside of Community of Christ campgrounds. So when we went to this uh, outside group, we didn't, and this is going to sound crazy, Carla, but we didn't have to do dishes. We didn't have to do KP. We had many, many of us had like motel style um, rooms with our own bathroom. We didn't have to clean those. We didn't have to cook. All of that stuff was taken care of and we could just be and enjoy. And we, ex we felt we can, we can do this. So as a mission center, we went through the painful process of letting go, but we found we can do this in other places. So um, the reunion we have, you know, we've got 160 to 170 folks that go to reunion. And so we needed a place that could house all that. For our leadership conferences and pastoral connections, that was a smaller subset. So we could find more local, more centralized venues. And there is a... Uh, campground jcc pearlstein which is literally in the wisconsin dells like you would never know that it was there but it's literally within the wisconsin dells and we've been um, journeying with them together and that's been a really great experience because they are orthodox jewish and so we've had some really great conversations with the rabbis there and we've had some really great experiences of um, God and the spirit in a place that is not community of Christ. And it has been a good experience. So what does camping look like when you sell all your campgrounds? Well, it means something different. It means you got to find uh, the spirit with the people in the place that you are. It's not always easy, but it is there. When you sell your campgrounds, then you have an endowment to possibly do more of them. We can do a lot of our gathering ministries that we talked about. You, you heard that list. It was a long list. And part of that is because we have we had the financial resources to deal with it. Now, fast forward, right? COVID hits. COVID has turned everything on its nose. One of the things that we struggled with, and it, it's a minor struggle, but one of the things that we struggled with is, well, we had deposits down with all these external venues. Okay, so we had to have the conversation about canceling, and then what does that deposit mean? One of the things we did not have to deal with was we have these campgrounds, and we can't use them, but we still need to keep the upkeep. And that has been something that I know that other mission centers have struggled with, but we we have a whole different set of struggles. What does camping look like? It looks much the same, except uh, we also have to find a place to to stay. That's really the the biggest difference. But it's been working well for us, I I believe. And I'll let the the rest of the panel share. But I wanted to share a little bit of that background, Carla, so that you can uh, hear where we're coming from. I do want to say something that 
Matt, you brought up for me. Um, when I started going to a campground that where you didn't have to do KP and you didn't have to do the dishes and you didn't have to clean your rooms. I remember walking around like the second day I was there thinking, why do we have so much more time? And it gives you so much more time together. I mean, it doesn't, meals don't take three hours, right? Because you have to wait till the KP people are done. You, you can be together more. And it was an amazing blessing because I was, I was pretty blown away by how much more time you had together because you didn't have to do those things. And I mean, KP is fun, blah, 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 but what a blessing to not have to do it. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Okay. Let's continue talking about the camping program. Cause this is, that was a really good hit, um, background, Matt. I understand a lot better now. Yeah. Let's keep talking. Um, I was going to follow up with what Matt said, the interesting conversations we've had with the people at Pearlstein being a different denomination. And I think that we did that with the Association Retreat Center too, and became really close with the staff that did work there, the kitchen help, and you could request certain foods and they would do their best to accommodate people. And, and if you had a problem in a room, you know, you just, you know, they had people that were just all over the place all the time. There was always someone you could contact. Um, I felt like they also cared about us uh, I can remember one time when there was a tornado warning and this, I mean, we knew what it was. So people were gathering in the tabernacle, but the staff members were knocking on every door, making sure everyone was taken care of any, any elderly needed help. And I mean that when Matt talked about the spirit being there, the spirit was there. Um, so we can speak to pros and cons, right? And, and to be honest, like one of the one of the struggles is, and Matt did kind of I think mention it briefly, but uh, finding a a venue that can meet our reunion needs is particularly it, it is hard. Um, we have been in the same place uh, we had been for several years because of uh, one of the big reasons, and part of it was it was had become kind of sacred space for us, but also the it's just hard to find a good a, a place that can accommodate them the multitude of ages and abilities and um, the sheer numbers of people that we have with reunion and so um so that that is um that was an interesting struggle and we are um looking actually at a potentially a new new place this summer but it took a lot of searching um to do that so we'll, we'll see if that if we do end up having in-person reunion and and what that looks like in the new place. The other thing I wanted to mention is that it not having uh, campgrounds frees us up to not be lo locked into a location. And I say that and I'm thinking about senior high and uh, we've, we've had senior high camp in our mission center. We've also traveled to Michigan one year uh, for senior high camp. We have done, we part of our rotation is that we offer a mission trip. So back in 2016, we went to Peru. Uh, we took our youth to Peru. Uh, we've done this year, this, this coming summer, we're looking at doing a mission trip to uh, South Dakota. And hopefully that will also be able to take place. Who knows? But uh, that is the current plan. And so we are able to offer those and think outside the box as far as what kind of ministry we want we want to offer our, our children and our youth. And so that I think when we when we own your campgrounds, you tend to be a little bit more locked into thinking, okay, this is this is where we have camp. And our our horizons have, have grown with what that can look like. I'd like to mention just another interesting thing that we've wrestled with. Uh, we have a camp space that we use for some of our youth camps again, Wisconsin Dells area, and it's great. They have lots of activities for the youth, like a ropes course, there's canoeing across the road. You know, it's, it's really great in a lot of ways, but we found that we had significant theological differences. This is a, a, another um, denomination run organization. And so that was really interesting because there was this dynamic of, will they let us come back? And then if they let us come back, do we want to go back? Um, so, but I think that's good for us to wrestle with and to talk about together and to also be able to have dialogue with them about. Um, so some of those interesting things come up that I think wouldn't have come up otherwise. That is so interesting to hear because 
I know when I was looking for a church to rent in the Provo, Utah area for our, our little group, I really thought that through. And I'm like, I don't necessarily want to rent a church that it goes is saying things about our theology that we wouldn't want to say, you know, like I, I wouldn't. So that's a really interesting point to bring up. And I think that's super important. I thank you for doing that. Even though they had a ropes course and canoes, I know. Oh, that's really hard to, to weigh. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> I totally understand. Yeah, it really is. Uh, anything else about the camping program? Well, I just think that you have all done an incredible job. I, I know that you know this because you hear it all the time, but I, I just want to say how, for me, um, I know this takes a ton of work and it takes a ton of organization and it seems like you are working as a well-oiled machine. So that is really cool to hear. Thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast and chat with me about it. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to say uh, before we sign off? I, I do want to say something. So I have been on the Mission Center presidency team for, I think this is my fourth year. So 2018 is when I came on. And I want to give thanks to the people that laid the groundwork and the people that went before us. So, um, and, you know, we, we did have a paid um, Mission Center president for, you know, up until, I'm not sure what year, Karen, do you know what year? 2015, I believe. So we've been all volunteer leadership since then. And, uh, you know, it, but it's kudos to, to him and to all the leaders that kind of set up and put these um, support pieces in place that we are able to make it work. So we all really stand on the shoulders of giants for sure. We're sure for sure. Uh, well, thanks again, all of you for to Matt and Colleen and Chris and Serena and Karen for being willing to discuss um, all the good work that you're doing. And thanks. Yeah, it's just been really great to learn more about how you um, do a volunteer leadership in the Headwaters Mission Center. So thanks so much. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Carla. Thanks for listening to Project Zion Podcast. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or whatever podcast streaming service you use. And while you are there, give us a five-star rating. Project Zion Podcast is sponsored by Latter-day Seeker Ministries of Community of Christ. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are of those speaking and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Latter-day Seeker Ministries or Community of Christ. The music has been graciously provided by Dave Hines. 